to make sure I'm being recorded all right. Macy, is the uh, microphone pointed all right? So. Oh, I have one on you. So thank you. Oh, that's right. So I'm, uh, I'm all set. <laughs> nice to be here again. It's always fun to come back to Bridgewater. I had so much fun when I was a kid here with Gail and Julia Merriam, you know, up there in the hill. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Judy was up there, too. She's here. <laughs> Dear friend, there you are. Oh, my goodness. Didn't we have fun? Yes, we did. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing with this coat on. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking, you know, the other day, when I was a kid, uh, my grandparents lived in South Pomfret, Hal and Anna Jilson, and I spent a lot of time up there, as I did here in Bridgewater, and once a year when I was a kid, this would be in the late 40s, 50s, there was something called the Hunt Supper. And it was held at the Grange Hall in South Pomfret. And I think, it, well, I think it was in the fall. I think it was in the early fall. And it was a supper. And, you know, all the women brought the dishes and, oh, the food was good. But it was the Hunt Supper because it was the Hunt Day. And all that day, men and women from South Pomfret went into the hills and shot things. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they totaled up, uh, they had a score. I mean, I suppose a chipmunk was a point, <laughs> and a woodchuck was five, and maybe a hedgehog was ten. And at the end of the day, whoever had the most points won the hunt. Now, I don't know what the prize was, maybe a rifle or something, I don't know. But I can remember late in the afternoon, my uncle Alan Jilson coming to my grandparents' house with a big paper bag filled with squirrels and chipmunks. What a slaughter that was. And he was only one of hundreds out there. So wonder anything was alive in the pomfret at the end of the day. I mean, I, it just, you know, it would be, People would go to jail for that today. <laughs> Why do I bring that up? <laughs> because I'm about to talk about the Vermont sharpshooters. And I'm about to say, in more ways than one, that the Vermont marksmen in the Civil War were the best shots in the Civil War. Why? Because we hunted. We hunted and hunted. Where's Janet Burnham? She's a dear friend of mine. Right there you are, Janet. Uh, Janet uh, produced a uh, uh, disc over here. What do you call those? A CD. A CD. I, I'm just out of it as far as com the computer age goes. Several years ago, and she got me to do the voice. And it's a story of a sharpshooter from Bethel. 
and uh, uh, in the same company that the Bridgewater boys were in. So it's a, it's a good source of information uh, for people here. But uh, the star of that uh, recording, it's, it's the writings of Charles Fairbanks, who was a sharpshooter. And he makes early on in the, in the recording, he says, my brother and I, who were sharpshooters, were born with guns in our hands. <laughs> That's the way it was, I guess. Uh, anyway, for some reason, we could shoot. Anyway, having said that, and by the way, we're not here today because of me. We're here today because of my friend Daryl Thompson, who gave that remarkable piece of hardware that's over in that case over there. What a heck of a gift for this uh, society. Thank you, Daryl, for not only me and these people, but for Vermont. That's a terrific uh, gift, uh, a rare firearm. Hiram Burdan was a remarkable man, sort of. <laughs> he came from western New York. He was an inventor before the Civil War. He had patents for a machine that separated gold ore, uh, gold from ore, and is still used. He invented a folding lifeboat that's still used. The, it's a concept. And he invented a bakery machine that sold like hotcakes. And he, and, he made, and he made a great deal of money before the Civil War. And when the Civil War began with the firing on Fort Sumter, he offered his services because he had, of course, an idea. He wanted to organize the best rifle shots in the northern states into a sharpshooter com uh, com company. His idea was 750 men in a, uh, in a regiment of 10 companies of 75 men each, 10 companies from, all, from 10 northern states. Uh, you see, the guy is invented. Nobody else had thought about this. But, so anyway, he takes the idea to Washington, to the War Department, Secretary of War Simon Cameron. Incidentally, Abraham Lincoln once said of Simon Cameron, the only thing he couldn't steal was a hot stove. <laughs> and Lincoln fired him fairly early on and, and uh, uh, he got rid of it. Uh, he didn't trust it. Burdan's idea was that the sharpshooters would stand between an eighth and three eighths of a mile behind the front lines and pick off the enemy officers at great distance. Good idea. Didn't work. Why? I think the main problem was battle smoke. So the sharpshooters, instead of generally through the war, instead of being three-eighths of a mile back, were up front as skirmishers. But they were, as we will see, uh, were effective. Now, he set up a test for his marksman that was a tough one. You had to show up at a tryout. You had to fire an unsupported weapon. You brought your own rifle musket. You had to fire unsupported from a distance of 200 yards at a 10-inch bullseye, and every shot had to be in the bullseye. Or they had a small bullseye, and every and the 10 shots had to be no more than a total of 50 inches from the small bullseye. That seems to me almost impossible. And I was in the army and I, you know, shot. And uh, I mean, that's tough, especially with those heavy, heavy, heavy rifles, you know. I mean, good Lord. Uh, and they had uh, tryouts were announced all over Vermont. I don't know where they all were. I'll tell you, Jeanette's got me working here, you know. I, I agreed to give a talk here on the sharpshooters, and I didn't know that much about the sharpshooters. There's a chapter in the full duty on them, but I've really been digging into this. And I've got more digging to go, and so if you, you ask me questions afterwards, I, I may not hit them very well, but you give me time, because I'm going to make this a statewide talk. I'm going to go start talking about this. You're starting something here. Uh, so they held trials. Where do we know they were? Rutland Fairgrounds, the Burlington Fairgrounds, which is now the north end of Burlington, Bethel, 
right in the middle of Bethel by the old railroad station. Randolph, where the Randolph Hospital is, that was the fairgrounds. We know there were trials in Bellows Falls, in Brattleboro, and Bennington. But there must have been many, many, many more, probably in Woodstock. I'm not certain about that. And they came out of the hills. The boys came out of the hills because they were all excited about being a sharpshooter. Now, Burdan uh, sweetened the pie. He designed a blue uniform with a blue hat with a feather in it and the fr fringes on the uniform. And then he had a gray overcoat, which was made for camouflage. In the winter, they'd wear the gray, light gray overcoat, so this would blend in with the snow and with the sear landscape, you see. But then Burdan had a second thought, and he changed the blue summer uniform to green so it would bend, blend in with the leaves. You see, he took a, took a mighty step forward here. In, in military camouflage. The guy was brilliant. He's an inventor. And so we, it was green in the summer and then the overcoat for the winter, which was changed later on because it looked just like the Confederate uniform. <laughs> so they had to darken it quite a bit. But anyway, uh, these were sexy uniforms, you see. And the boys just loved them, you know. And, and, uh, on June 15, 1861, Secretary of Cameron approved the organization of the regiments. Now, Burdan was a very rich man, and he knew a lot of very rich people. And to get these regiments organized, get these companies organized, actually, he's going to have one regiment of 10 companies. He contacts the wealthy men he knows around the country, and one of them he contacts is William Y.W. Ripley over in Rutland. The Ripley family made a lot of mon money on New York hotels. They also started a granite quarry over in West Rutland. So they had a lot of money, and it so happened that William Y.W. Ripley was one hell of a shot, maybe the best marksman in Vermont. His brother would become even more famous. Uh, his brother would become uh, Edward Hastings Ripley, commander of the 9th Vermont Regiment, and lead the first Union soldiers into Richmond when Richmond fell uh, in early April 1865. So the tryouts were held. The enlistments were to be for a long three years. It didn't stop the men at all. The first company formed of the first U.S. sharpshooters gathered at Randolph after the local trial on the Randolph Fairgrounds. And they had a couple of days of shooting up there under a guy named Homer Stoughton, who eventually would win a Medal of, Medal of Honor. 113 men qualified for that company, but they cut 13 off and headed south on September 15th for Weehawken, New Jersey. That's where Burdan was organizing his first regiment at Weehawken, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from New York City. And it became, his camp there became a tourist attraction. People came by the thousands to see the sharpshooters training. They hadn't been there but a couple of days. On a Saturday, Burdan decided to give a shooting demonstration. Burdan might have been the best shooter in the country. This day, with thousands of people looking on, he set up a man-sized target 200 yards away from him. The wind was blowing. Now, that makes shooting a lot more difficult. I remember my Army days. They talk about Tennessee elevation and Kentucky windage. You know, you have to compensate for that stuff. And uh, so the wind is blowing. Burdan takes aim in the first shot hits a man, this figure of a man, a life-size figure of a man, 200 yards, which Burdan called Jefferson Davis. <laughs> hits him in the cheek, the first shot. Second shot in the cap. The third, Burdan turns around to the crowd and says, I'm going to put his eye out. And he did. My God. And then he asked the spectators to tell him where to put the shots. Ear, bang. Top of head, bang. 
other eye, bang, between the eyes. And now, Verdan moves a thousand feet away. The wind had picked up. And he shoots at one of the regular targets with a little bullseye. Ten shots, a total of 22 inches from the center. My God, that is really shooting. September 24th, uh, they, uh, their regiment moves south to Washington, to a hillside camp north of the city called Camp of Instruction. Now, incidentally, listen to this one. Verdan had a wife who liked high society. Woodstock type. <laughs> and they had a grand home on Long Island. Verdan had her sell that. They were getting famous and the price was good. And you know where she went for the war to live with her parents? West Lebanon, New Hampshire. <laughs> now Verdan comes to Vermont. I don't know much about this yet. But he comes up to Vermont to hold some of these tryout camps. I don't know yet where he was, but you damn well better bet that if he was in West Lebanon, he came to Woodstock for dinner, right? <laughs> of course he did, yeah. I'm going to find the house over there in, in, in West Lebanon. So he's a local boy. He's one of the early stars of the war, but watch out. Now one day Abraham Lincoln comes out to watch the practice at the camp of instruction. And with him comes General George Brinton McClellan. And Lincoln, after watching the shooting, goes over to a Vermont boy, Cassius Peck from Brookfield, and says, can I have that, that rifle of yours? Of course, Cassius didn't go say no. And Lincoln fires five shots. And I can't find an exact description, but the soldiers say he was a shooter. He was a marksman. I don't know. Lincoln laughed. He had more fun. Now the men brought with them their own weapons. Burdan, who was a lousy organizer, he had no military experience, could only get 50 rifles, Springfield rifles, for his men. The Springfields were apparently pretty good at long range, but not great. Uh, Meanwhile, he didn't know how to set up a camp. So the latrines are on the top of the hill and the, can the tents are on the bottom. <laughs> you know? And the men started getting very sick. But Berdan didn't, didn't have to worry because he was in a brick house off to the side of the camp. And the men began to complain about him. Said he was a show off. Said he didn't know what he was doing. There was some truth to that. Some of his officers quit. They said he was arrogant. No rifles came, so Burdan ordered a bunch of Colt's rifles. But they didn't come either. And then a few came and he tried them out and he didn't like them, so he ordered Sharps rifles. And those apparently worked pretty well. But the Sharps rifles came with bayonets and the men hated the bayonets. Why? Because they had been told that they weren't going to be regular infantrymen. They weren't going to have to charge people. They were going to be back, you know, shooting. We don't want to be infantrymen. So they either lost their bayonets <laughs> or bent them up into cooking utensils. And uh, anyway, they didn't have any bayonets. Verdan now finally, after a lot of trying, he's been a civilian, gets appointed a colonel. Men don't like that. So we've got one company in the first U.S. sharpshooters, Vermonters. And now two more companies of Vermonters are organized. Company E and Company H of the second U.S. sharpshooter regiment. And Company E is the regiment the local boys served in. And their names, familiar names to me, having grown up around here, a lot of them, Edward Atwood, Henry Blanchard, George Clay, Tilton Cutts, James Daggett, Horace Hathorne, William Hathorne, 
Wallace Robinson, David Sawyer, Edwin Sawyer, Addison Spicer, and then to Algeroy Thompson, who owned that rifle, but he's listed from Woodstock in the official reports, but that only means he enlisted in Woodstock, but he was a Bridgewater. He was a Bridgewater lad, right? Do you know where he lived, Daryl? I don't know for sure. It's possible that it was in the house um, across from where Bump Davis's store was. Oh. The 1869 map shows D.A. Thompson living here, just this side of the block. That's probably it. Yeah. Let's go hunt for that someday, shall we? Okay. okay. Company A. Third Vermont. Company A, Third Vermont, that's the second, uh, excuse me, Company A of the second Vermont Shropshire is gathers at Brattleboro and then go on to Washington. Companies E, the local company, and H are signed to the first corps of the Army of the Potomac. And these two companies would basically fight together throughout the Civil War. Now, in the spring of 1861, the big scene is the Peninsula Campaign, uh, where McClellan tries to capture Richmond by taking his army down to the Virginia Peninsula and then attacking from the southeast by land. It results in the Seven Days Battles. Some of the earliest fighting is along the Warwick River between Yorktown, uh, near Yorktown, Virginia. It's a river, oh, as wide as the Ottaquiche. And the sharpshooters were sent out to silence some Confederate artillery across the way. And they were so damn good that they stopped artillery firing for a thousand yards on either side of them. That's good shooting. Ripley went out one day and he saw one of his men get killed by a Confederate marksman. Ripley goes to the corner of a building and he peeks around the corner of that building and a bullet hits just beside his head. Ripley waits and waits and then he peeks around the corner. Another bullet comes in and then he peeks around and he sees the Confederate sharpshooter rise. The shots are instantaneous and the Confederate falls dead and the bullet hits right beside Ripley's head, but he is all right. The fighting moves to Richmond to the Seven Days Battles. The first big battle at Gaines's Mills, the sharpshooters are heavily engaged, but Burdan is nowhere to be seen. He says he's gone back to headquarters to get more supplies. Then after the battle, he reports that it was him alone that stopped 6,000 uh, 6, Union soldiers from cowardly retreating across a river. The men don't believe one bit of this. They think he's just a coward. And in the end, he gets court-martialed for cowardice, but he beats it. He beats the rap. The seven days ends at Malvern Hill with Ripley now commanding all the men. Verdan is nowhere to be seen. And the final stand of the seven days is at Malvern Hill, where Lee watch, launches a frontal attack uh, up hill against well-entrenched Union soldiers. The Confederates wipe out two Union batteries with, uh, the, the uh, sharpshooters wipe out two Confederate batteries with their amazing shooting. And there's a slaughter on the slopes of Malvern Hill that precedes, that predicts almost the, the slaughter at P Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. The campaign ends in Union failure, but the sharpshooters have made a good name for themselves, and now they have their new rifles, the Sharps rifles. Well, Burdan's court-martial happens. He's acquitted. He puts one of his officers on trial for insubordination. He's acquitted. Now, while all this is going on on the peninsula, the Bridgewater boys and the two uh, uh, companies in the second U.S. sharpshooters are moved in the, into the, from Washington down uh, south toward Fredericksburg and then they're fighting in the Shenandoah Valley and they're put on a train and moved to the Shenandoah Valley but the train gets run, has a head-on collision with another train and a lot of those uh, Bridgewater boys got injured uh, 
One man was killed in the train wreck. Late in the summer of 62, there's a huge battle at 2nd Manassas. And uh, the sharpshooters of the E and H companies, uh, the Bridgewater Boys, are heavily engaged at Manassas. Then comes the Antietam campaign. Lee invades the North for the first time. The Union forces have to fight their way over South Mountain to reach the battlefield at Antietam. And they have to fight their way through two gaps in the mountains. The southern gap is Crampton's Gap. And I knew that the Vermont infantry carried that gap by attacking up some very steep hills. Confederates didn't think anybody could climb hills that steep. Huh. <laughs> Vermonters. But I never knew until Jeanette got me working here that the northern gap was cleared by the second sharpshooter. Vermonters going up those hills on either side of the gap. I never knew that. So the battle goes to Antietam, the great battle, early battle of the Civil War. James McPherson says the most important battle of the Civil War. It's the big battle is one day long, September 17th. On the 16th, the Union Army is, uh, Easterly Corps under, uh, under Hooker, Joseph Hooker, moves in the evening across the Antietam Creek led by companies E and H. There's a brief fight, and then the next day, of course, all hell breaks loose. 24,000 American casualties in one day at Antietam. It is a bloody draw. The, uh, your local boys, the sharpshooters E and H, fight in the worst, on the worst part of the Antietam battlefield. The cornfield where the fighting was early in the morning, 7,000 casualties in about an hour there. There's a monument today to the Vermont sharpshooters on the edge of the cornfield. Vicious fighting. They were holding off, trying to hold off Stonewall Jackson's men. And Lee, finally outnumbered, has to retreat across the Potomac. There's an attempt made to to overtake Lee's retreat. And at Boatler's Ford on the Potomac, the sharpshooters uh, attack. And our friend Cassius Peck from Brookfield, who had loaned Lincoln his rifle, wins a Medal of Honor at Boatler's Ford for going across the wide, wide river and capturing uh, a battery of Confederate uh, cannon. In December, a whole bunch of recruits come down from Vermont. The numbers of the sharpshooters are getting very, very small. Homer Stoughton of Randolph officially becomes commander of the second U.S. sharpshooters. All three companies of Vermont sharpshooters fight at second Fredericksburg in December. One company uh, of the second, not your boys, only escapes from the battlefield by piling dead Union bodies in front of them and crawling off the battlefield. That was Company F. Now, 1863, the spring, the Battle of Chancellorsville, the great battle at Chancellorsville. Your, the two companies of H, including Company E, are in the heart of the fighting around the Chancellorsville crossroads. They, uh, they get cut off south of Chancellorsville, trying to overtake Jan Jackson's flank attack. Before they battle their way back, they capture 600 Confederate prisoners. A remarkable show. The sharpshooters could be terrifying, you know. You're getting hit from places you can't possibly be hit. Lee wins decisively at Chancellorsville. So what does he do? He decides to invade the North again. And now all the sharpshooters and all the Union Army of the Potomac is on the march north to Pennsylvania. And the fighting begins on the first day of July, 1863, around the town where nine roads come together called Gettysburg. Now comes the great moment for the sharpshooters. At the end of the first day's fighting, the Union line goes from Culp's Hill in the north. Here's Gettysburg. Culp's Hill in the north, Cemetery Hill in the north, 
all the way down Cemetery Ridge, a clump of trees, little round top, big round top. The first day's fighting is a Confederate victory. The Union forces are driven through the town and take up this position. The most famous fish hook in the history of the world. The second day's fighting, Robert E. Lee sends Longstreet, James Longstreet, on a long march through the hills. And late in the afternoon, he is to attack with 18,000 men the southern end of the Union line. Now, if you're a Civil War buff at all, you've probably read the book Killer Angels by Sherrard, or you've seen the movie Gettysburg. It's all about how the 20th Maine Regiment held Little Round Top. If Little Round Top had fallen, the whole Union line would have collapsed because Little Round Top was a bare summit and you could put artillery up there and shoot almost the length of the Union line. Little Round Top had to be held. And just in time, as the Confederate attack is coming in across the fields, the 20th Maine under Joshua Warren Orange Chamberlain gets here, forms a ragged line, fights off three Confederate assaults, and when they run out of ammunition, they launch a bayonet charge down the hill, and Little Round Top is saved. And uh, the case can be made that Gettysburg was saved that day. Just in time did they reach Little Round Top. They were part of Strong Vincent's brigade, a Dartmouth boy, by the way, whose brigade covered all this area. And uh, the Union General, Governor K. Warren, had gotten to the top of Round Top just before they saw it was undefended hastened the closest troops he could get up there, and it was the 20th Maine, and they went into history, one of the great moments in American military history. But, <laughs> before all this start, out here in the middle of the valley, of course, this is Cemetery Ridge right here, the Union position. Over here is Seminary Ridge, and the Emmitsburg Road comes down the, mi the middle of the valley. The Union line is right along here. This area is covered by the Third Corps. The second sharpshooters are attached now to the Third Corps. Daniel Sickles commands the Third Corps. About two o'clock, he sends the other company of sharpshooters out to the Emmitsburg Road to see if there's any Confederates around. And they go into the woods behind, uh, they go into the woods all the way, uh, they cross the Emmitsburg Road, go into the woods in this area, and they find a load of Confederates, thousands of them. So some of them get captured, but they come back and they tell Sickles, I guess there's Confederates out there. So Sickles disobeys orders. And he moves his third corps all the way out to the Emmitsburg Road, bulging out from the Union line, totally against orders. Because the Emmitsburg Road here is higher ground than Cemetery Ridge where his corps is. And so he said, if they capture, you know, if they move out there and get that high road, they're going to be able to blast me with artillery. I can't hold it. It's still the most controversial move made during the Civil War. But anyway, it was because of Sickles and the sharpshooter's discovery that Sickles moves his 12,000 men out there. Now, your boys, E Company, they are posted out in this area on a farm called the Slider Farm behind a long stone wall with rail fence on top. Oh, perfect, perfect position for sharpshooters. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. And Longstreet launches his 18,000 men in an on echelon attack. That means 
the attack starts here and then more companies come in and more companies come in and finally the, fire, the, the fighting is going all up and down this road. So here come the first Confederates across this field headed for Little Round Top. There is nobody yet on Little Round Top. The sharpshooters open fire from behind that fence and they fire and they drive the Confederate advance back. The Confederates reform and come on and the sharpshooters hold here until the Confederates are within 100 yards of them. And the Confederates talk about heavy casualties from this. Finally, the sharpshooters are forced to give way and they move back through the gorge in Little Round Top. But as they're moving back, they see Chamberlain's men come onto the hill. Had it not been for those sharpshooters, they would have gotten Round Top. So who won that second day anyway? <laughs> right there, that rifle. It's amazing. This is just, I've just come on this. <laughs> I know it now. They, the sharpshooters remember seeing those soldiers coming onto those hills. It made possible Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's defense of Little Round Top and saved the day. My God. And when Chamberlain launches his counterattack, one company of those sharpshooters, I don't know who it is yet. I hope it's E. I hope it's the Bridgewater boys. <laughs> join Chamberlain in that attack. Remarkable. The great moment of the sharpshooters in the Civil War. After that second day at Gettysburg, of course, comes Pickett's charge. Some of the sharpshooters, including your boys, are engaged in helping to fight off Pickett's charge. Of course, the second Vermont Brigade wins Gettysburg by smashing the flank of Pickett's charge. I spoke at the 150th at Gettysburg and told 2,000 people that Vermont won the Battle of Gettysburg and then I went, ooh, here it comes and nobody argued. <laughs> nobody argued by God. They believe it now. It's true. Of course, they wouldn't have had that opportunity if Round Top had fallen. Wow. Gettysburg, Gettysburg ends. Verdan got trapped at Gettysburg up near the front lines. He was in the thick of it. So right after Gettysburg, he gets sick. And he goes home to West Lebanon. <laughs> Long, enjoyable evenings at the inn, I'm sure, having dinner, right? <laughs> While the boys struggle on. 1863 ends with fighting at Mine Run, uh, and then we come to the spring of 1864, the horrible overland campaign. It will last 80 days and cost 80,000 American casualties. The first heavy fighting is in the wilderness. The Vermont Brigade becomes national heroes, losing a thousand men in one day, keeping Grant's army from being separated. The sharpshooters are in the same area of the battlefield at the Brock and Plank Road crossroads. Wallace Robinson of Bridgewater is killed there on the 6th of May. Some of the breastworks caught fire in the wilderness and men burned to death. I've always known that none of the Vermonters were in that area, but it appears the sharpshooters may have been. Did Robinson possibly have burned? He may have burned to death. I'm going to find this out, but it's a furious fighting uh, at, 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 at uh, uh, Wilderness. And then they move south to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Now listen to this. The fighting at Spotsylvania will last two weeks. But the initial fighting at Spotsylvania is uh, in an area called the Bloody Angle, a battle that went on for 24 hours in the pouring rain with the armies separated only by uh, an earthwork. 30,000 on each side of this earthwork. It's, it's a horrible uh, slaughter. On the way to Bloody Angle, the Vermont sharpshooters are leading the way and they come upon some skirmishers who are complaining that they're getting shot by a Confederate somewhere in a distant tree. And the sharpshooters can pick him out 
1,500 yards away, and they attach pieces of wood to their sights to compensate for the distance, 1,500 feet, and they get him. I mean, the, all the army was talking about these shots. Bloody angle Edward Atwood is wounded. On the 16th in trench warfare, the Algernon Thompson <coughs> wounded. Giles Roy. Yeah, let me get that right. Now the march is south toward Richmond, and the sharpshooters one day burst into this little village north of Richmond called Bowling Green. I remember it well because I got sent to Camp A.P. Hill for reserve duty at Bowling Green after my time in the Army. They burst into this village, and the jail is filled with hundreds of slaves who are about to be shipped south. They are escaped slaves who have been recaptured. They're about to be shipped south to the worst, the tobacco plantations. And the sharpshooters free these hundreds of slaves. I think it may be their greatest moment. And then they fight at Cold Harbor in the trenches. That's maybe the great image from the Civil War. Homer. Winslow Homer's The Sharpshooter at probably from Cold Harbor. Do you know, I hate to say this, but the soldiers on both sides of the Union and Confederate did not like the sharpshooters. They didn't think it was fair. They'd be a mile behind the lines, you know, having supper. And all of a sudden, their friend would fall dead, you know, from an unseen someone in a tree. They didn't like that. They didn't get it was fair. The fighting, at, they fight at Cold Harbor, the long range shooting. And then the war moves to Petersburg in the long nine months of siege. This was sharpshooter stuff. It was World War II war. Two sides in trenches across a no man's land it was a sharpshooter's paradise. One, some Vermont sharpshooters found a house with the leather chairs still in them. And they set up the leather chairs by the window and laid back there and just, no, oh, they had a ball. And then Lee surrenders. But the sharpshooters have to march way down to Danville, Virginia in pursuit of Jefferson Davis. And while they're down there, they get word that Lincoln is dead. Lincoln loved the sharpshooters. He'd uh, check on them out every so often. They didn't need anything, you know, after finally Burdan got his act together. Never did, really. But and they get word down there at Danville that Lincoln is dead. Where's that? Janet Burnham's wonderful little production here. Charles Fairbanks. From the fought with the Bridgewater boys. Charles Fairbanks finds out that Lincoln is dead. It was the saddest day of my army life. We were to have marched in the grand review to pass the to march by the grandest statesman of the age. The man with his pistol took from the earth the man of all others. The man the soldiers loved. In the sharpshooter regiment, in the sharpshooter regiments, in the same one the Bridgewater boys were in, was a uh, lad from Rutland, Charles Meade. Charles Meade. Uh, when I lived in Shrewsbury, a family over there had his diary. And I used it to write the battered stars. Charles Meade was a young writer. Oh, what a writer he would have been. A sharpshooter and a writer. And he reaches Petersburg. And they're in the trenches. His brother was with him. His brother uh, was with him. And uh, 
He wrote in his diary, <coughs> June 17th, Charles was shot about 7 a.m. and died at 7.30 a.m. He did not speak a word after he was hit. The ball struck him over the right ear and came out the backside of his head taking a right oblique course. It passed through a yellow pine log six inches in diameter before it hit Charlie. I write this not knowing whether I can ever be permitted to write more particular account, hoping it may reach home. Then he did write a more particular account. It was about 7 a.m. We were all watching that Charlie was hit. I was in the same pit also David Loran, the Indian. We had a pole of sticks to shoot under and just room enough to stick our guns through. The ball went through the rail. The Indian said a good shot. Charlie didn't say anything about it. He never moved. He spoke, I spoke to him. He did not answer. I took him back a little into a small hut, but he said nothing sensible. He made noises. He died at half past eight. With the aid of three others, detailed to assist, a place is selected, a strong box made, and when the darkness will allow, the body is brought away, and at the hour of ten is, is, is deposited in a lonely Virginia grave. Thus suddenly and thus sadly, in its freshness and in its strength, his noble life is laid as a sacrifice upon his country's altar. And then one more thing as we conclude here. Something that Charles Meade wrote while on the march earlier in the war. Incidentally, I was going to be given that diary. But the woman who owned it found out that I didn't like George Bush, and she never did give it to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the Rutland Historical Society. It's OK. <laughs> Close call. <laughs> the sharpshooter Meade, a year before he was killed, Life has been compared to a ship, a book, the drumming of a partridge, the seasons, a journey, and to many other things, but all are inadequate to express in its full sense the true meaning of the term of life. Nor is more mortal capable of showing all its reality by the use of feeble words. When we can look back through the dim vistas of the years, may there be a few things to, to regret. And when we have passed innumerable and now incomprehensible years in the next world, we shall look back to this life as but a drop in the ocean of time. Then we shall just begin to know something of the reality and the meaning of the term of life. Vermont sent 600 and 20 sharpshooters to the Union Army on a per capita basis that is twice as many as any other northern state. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Yeah. Stand up. There's the man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all of us. That is wonderful. Questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Were the sharpshooters the only ones outfitted with that rifle? That's a damn good question. That's uh, probably down the road in my research. I think so. Nope. Oh, see, here he goes. He's way ahead of me. Okay, go for it. Um, uh, other units had them also. Really? Yeah. What was it? Yeah. I, I don't know which units, I, uh, I, I've read of units having them, but I don't recall which ones they were, but definitely others have them. In the, uh, in the beginning, though, it was the sharpshooters. Um, the special order that went in was yes. certainly for the sharpshooters. Right. Also, interestingly, Burdan looked at and turned down the Spencer repeating rifle. That's five or six consecutive shots. I mean, a se a seven? I mean, you know, it may not have been as accurate, but boy, I mean, a sharpshooter with 
five or six consecutive shots. My God, I wonder if Berdan made a mistake there. I'm not sure. They only took one shot. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I got another question. Sure. Now. The, uh, the regiments, how did they get assigned to the different corps? You had Vermonters in the Shenandoah Valley with uh, Sh what, Sheridan. Yes. And you had Vermonters at the ar in the Army of the, of the Potomac, and probably in the defense of Washington. How, who decided what, which regiments went to those corps? It was the War Department that, that, that decided it. A guy like Halleck or something like that? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, Halleck. Uh, but once, of course, once uh, McClellan got ensconced as commander, he began making those decisions. And then, of course, when Grant took over all the armies, it was his total say-so. Generally, the, uh, well, the five regiments, uh, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth Vermont regiments, made up the Vermont Brigade that was assigned to the Sixth Corps of the Army of the Potomac under General Sedgwick. And they stayed in that corps throughout the war but they were taken out of the Army of the Potomac in 1864 and sent to the Shenandoah Valley under Sheridan, the Army of the Valley, uh, and fought out there and then came back uh, to Petersburg. But they always stayed in the Corps. They generally stayed in the Corps, although sometimes over the course of the war, some Corps were disbanded as the casualties got heavy. By the way, the sharpshooters, and I did forgot to mention this, the sharpshooters only existed until February of 1864. And then they got so small with, with all the casualties, they were made part of the 4th Vermont Regiment. But within the 4th Vermont Regiment, they were used as sharpshooters. And, that's, and they really, I should have mentioned this, when they, really get the, when they get down to Danville, Virginia, they're marching with the 4th Vermont Regiment. They hated that. They didn't want to be part of the regular army. Remember, they didn't like the bayonets and all that stuff? They thought they were something special. Well, they were. They were, yeah. yeah. So, did, did the Confederates have sharpshooters? Uh, not officially. Not officially, but the Union uh, sharpshooters, uh, in some of the letters I have read, uh, the Union sharpshooters remark on how good a shots the Confederates were. There was a mm, rifle tradition in the South, like a horse tradition. I don't think there are any better than the Vermonters, though. <laughs> Yes, sir. On another subject, uh, there's a George W. York buried over the Hockland Village Cemetery uh, in Lot 26. I looked up and found that he bought that lot when his wife and infant son passed away. And then that was in uh, April of 78. And he died in September of 78. And his service is attributed to the second U.S. shock shooters. Yeah. Company K. Company K. Well, that's interesting. I got some of this information from Tom Ledoux up in Burlington. Yeah. Was he a Vermonter? This I mean, he was buried this here. This York. This yes. York. Yes. Was he a native Vermonter? Yes. I don't know what to tell you. My guess might be that... Uh, more Vermonters qualified than they could have used, and maybe some of these guys went to other states and enlisted, because other states had trouble filling their well, quotas. He's buried in Heartland and lived in Heartland. Yeah, but he's not in a Vermont company. Second U.S. shop shooters. Yeah, but that's not a, yeah, what's a company? I think it was attributed to company K. K. Was there such a? Yes, oh yeah. But I don't, it's not a Vermont company, I don't think. It's not. Not a Vermont company. How about the first, first regiment? What was the company in that one? The first regiment wasn't that. That might have been K. I don't think so. Am I crazy? <coughs> Let me check. You see, I'm just learning this. You see, you're going to scratch right through my veneer here pretty quick. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Well, I, I've, doused, I've doused the lot. Oh, you have? Yeah. And there's three burials in the lot, but there's not a monument. There's not a gravestone. Huh. The only thing there is a Confederate mm -hmm. emblem with a flag. And so, where do I go to try to get money to have a gravestone made for him? 
Uh, well, uh, you can go to the uh, uh, defense department. Okay, no. I don't know how it, uh, your town clerk should have the information on how to apply for mm -hmm. a soldier gravestone. Because I was told that you have to be a relative of the deceased person in order to have that. That I don't know. That I don't know. Well, you're the fifth cousin seven times removed. That would prove you're different. <laughs> Incidentally, speaking of metal detectors, uh, I'm just off to do a TV show in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a metal detector up in Franklin County, Vermont has found five Confederate pistol bullets from the St. Albans raid uh, mm -hmm. at the bank that they tried to rob in Sheldon, which shows that they were shooting at the bank. It's going to change the whole history, though. That's a secret. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where was the sharp weapon made? Where was that made? The, uh, sh uh, you know? Uh, Hartford. Hartford, Hartford, yes. Hartford, Hartford. Hartford. Yeah. Yeah. Was it associated with Colts or anything, or what? Uh, no, no. They, they had Colts. They had 50 Colts, and Bernand didn't like them. Colt was hard for two, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, Springfield, the Springfield Mats. Yeah. Did Bernand ever get back with his uh, troops? No. <laughs> no, I think he had, he didn't like it. He was too close to the front line at Gettysburg. And there was a big, uh, the War Department came after him. Uh, uh, they said, you know, we need proof that you're not well. And because he'd been seen out gallivanting, you know. But he, you know, he, you know, he had money and he had some pull and he had connections and he managed to avoid it. He's a strange cat, you know. He was not a military man. He had this brilliant idea about the sharpshooters and then the camouflage is just sheer brilliance, you know. Nobody else had thought of it. And, uh, and so you credit him with getting it going, you know. But he just simply was not a fighter. He hadn't had any military training. And uh, Lincoln used to, you know, refuse to sign death warrants for soldiers who were to be executed for desertion. He said they just have feet they can't control. <laughs> Lincoln hated to kill anybody, you see. I mean, I love that about him, you know. And I guess that's what kind of feet Burdett had, you know. I don't, that's charitable. Hey, yes, Dale. <laughs> Uh, as far as the green uniforms go, they go back to Rogers Rangers. They go back to Rogers Rangers, but it had been discontinued in the U.S. Right, in, the, in the military. That's right. The other thing, the, spe the special rifles, um, a lot of them were purchased by the commanders for their troops because the War Department did not want uh, rifles that could fire more rapidly than a muzzleloader because it was going to burn up too much ammunition and cost them too much. Oh. Right. That was the big complaint about the Spencers. And the same thing with the Henry rifles, the ones that they said you load on Sunday and shoot all week. <laughs> uh, a lot of the, like Illinois and Indiana commanders <coughs> bought the Henrys and supplied them to their troops. Well, it, you know, it, uh, thank you. I mean, that, uh, there must have been and I'll dwell on this, but you know, I go back to my uncle's bag full of squirrels <laughs> in the hunt supper, and there must have been. I, 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 something in my head tells me that Vermont, being that state without a coastline, you know, and you know, that's what we did. You know, they, they shot. My God, when I was a kid, all my family, had, except my father, he wouldn't shoot anything, had uh, had rifles. It takes a lot of squirrels to feed. You. Feed somebody. <laughs> well, I suppose it does. My, my father gave me a BB gun when I was 10 years old, and I took it down across the road, and there was a robin sitting way, way up on a branch, and I hit the damn thing on the first shot, and it fell and it right at my feet. That was, that was it for me. I, I felt so awful. I ended up in the Army anyway, so what does it matter? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How and why did Vermont have more sharpshooters than anyone else? Or I don't know. I don't know. I mean, more qualified per capita now, per capita, you know, we're a tiny state, but more qualified per capita than any other state. We were better shots, that's why. And why was that? That's the mystery. Vermonters could shoot. 
And there's a, I think there's just a tradition of it here, you know, it was what you did when you were young. You learned to shoot and it was a, a pastime, you know, it was a, a hobby. I, you know, if there's another answer for it, I just don't know, but I don't think we had youth marksmanship training, do you? <laughs> no, the farms are individual units, yeah. I think a lot of the skill came from just Vermont ingenuity, but I think just the resources that the northern states had in terms of munition was a big part. That's of an interesting it. point. That's an interesting point. Also, you never want to forget the presence here of a military academy. Uh, was uh, Norwich. Uh, they were, uh, you know, available, they had been available uh, to teach local, you know, some towns had militia companies well before the Civil War, uh, just because they wanted to have them, you know, but, so that's a possibility too, but it, it's still something, a mystery, yeah. So the second U.S. sharpshooters was made up of people from all over the yeah. states? All yeah, the states. yeah, yeah, ten states. 10 states, all over the north, yes. I once heard that uh, Sherman's uh, uh, logistics chief, uh, logistics chief was a, a graduate of Norwich. You don't know Did his you name. Did you ever hear of that? Uh, that rings a faint bell, but I, no I names. I might have heard it from you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He's a regular, those two guys are regulars on my bus tours back there. <laughs> We travel hundreds of miles of Civil War battles. I, you know, I, I can't think who that would have been. No, I can't. Sure, I mean, it's March to uh, March to the sea. Was, March to the sea. Yeah, yeah. It was a logistic chief. Yeah, that was a yeah a six two hundred mile picnic. <laughs> Not much fighting. Anyone else? Well, oh, one more. Yeah. Uh, just two points. Uh, somebody asked about uh, other units having the Sharps rifle, and uh, one unit that had it was uh, referred to as the Bucktails. It's a Pennsylvania outfit. And uh, the, the second point is that uh, Jeanette has a book here by a guy named uh, Wiley Sword. It's about Burdan, it's about the rifle, it's about the sharpshooters, and uh, uh, my request when I gave it to her was that uh, people be allowed to sign it out. So if somebody wants to read more, there is a book here that um, does have more information. And Howard, I gave you a book some time ago. Yes, you, yes, and that's the only thing I forgot to bring today. That should go to Jeanette also. Oh, okay, fine. Jeanette, you will get it. Well, this event, uh, it, from a personal uh, point of view, I mean, I, any time Jeanette calls, I'll come down here and talk. I love this place. But, uh, you know, if I ever get a chance to speak at Gettysburg again, they better hurry up. Uh, I can now say that Vermont won the second and third days at Gettysburg because the sharpshooters made possible the defense of Little Round Top and of course, we know the 2nd Vermont Brigade defeated Pickett's Charge. Thank you. Thank you, and there are refreshments in the back. Be sure to talk to Daryl about the gun or don't miss the gun. If anybody's interested in books or, or CDs, I sign them for nothing. Hi. Hi, Jim. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, Standard now. Oh. Okay. We smash the gut.